Happy Tuesday, Brianna. How do you plan to spend one of the DC's only holidays? <laughs> Are we counting the State of the, <laughs> the Union as a holiday? Um, I'm going to record for my podcast. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to write my radar just like I do every night, Kinky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be watching the State of the Union and you'll get our reaction to it tomorrow, of course. But what are we talking about today? Well, in anticipation of tonight, the Capitol grounds have once again become a fortress of sorts as President Biden is set to address the nation on the State of the Union tonight at 9 p.m. It will be the first speech Biden gives after Republicans have regained control of the House. Biden seems to be preparing for tonight's speech over some cookies and milk, a very wholesome, if low-protein, way to prepare. Hmm. Meanwhile, Punchbowl News lays out what to watch in tonight's address and the top things they are watching out for. Can Biden's good news break through? As we discussed yesterday, Biden's polling numbers are less than ideal, this despite Democrats having outperformed expectations in the November midterm elections and several legislative accomplishments in Biden's first term. A new Washington Post ABC News poll shows that 60 2 percent of Americans say President Biden has not achieved much during his first two years in office, and a majority of Democrats, 52 percent in fact, don't even want him to seek re-election in 2024. Yikes. Mm. What's more, a new Monmouth University poll finds that despite the fact that the U.S. economy is growing, unemployment is the lowest it's been since 1969 and the likelihood of a recession is receding. According to Goldman Sachs, a record number of people report they're worse off now than they were two years ago. A new ABC Washington Post poll released this week found 41 percent of Americans say they're in worse shape financially since Biden took office. This is this age-old gap between the Janet Yellen of the world and the economists who like to get on TV and say everything is fine. But it's not the case. And it's not, I don't even think, necessarily attributable to the short-term cycles of presidencies. We've seen a multi-decade generational decline in American standard of living. And so trying to pitch the American public that, okay, things are incrementally better than they were a year or two ago, doesn't get to the core of the issue, which is that millennials as an entire generation are the first not to do as well as their boomer parents and on and on down the line. Well, and a year or two ago, three years ago, was the worst thing that has happened in many of our lifetimes, yeah. uh, a, a crushing economic depression brought on by the pandemic. So it, it's never enough to just say, oh, we're doing better than we were then. Of course we're doing better than we were then. And Biden likes to take credit for just kind of going back on, on some levels, returning to, to how the economy was, how various things were before the pandemic hit, and say, look, we fixed this, when it's like, I don't know that you get credit for that. Well, look, I, I think that all politicians do that, right? When 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 uh, Obama came in in the middle of, at the beginning of the recession, there were a lot of people who pointed to that and said, "Oh, he just spent so much." When you know it was the recession era right. spending, everybody everybody does this. Each side makes that argument. Where the American people miss out is that instead of making comparisons to what the other party did or didn't, didn't do, they're not making absolute claims about how they're going to actually improve, improve people's lives prospectively and what the parties could be doing if they actually had any interest in doing that instead of just scoring points on each other. So, okay, even if it's true that Biden is better than two years ago, what? Why should people vote for him again? Why is he comparing himself just against, again, this pandemic era standard instead of making a case for not only what he could potentially do, but what the Republicans, by contrast, perhaps aren't willing to do? And so the American people can get a real good sense of what they will get if they vote for one candidate over the other. Mm. Well, uh, some other things we'll be keeping an eye on tonight. Biden will call for quadrupling the levy on corporate stock buybacks and will renew his calls for a minimum tax on billionaires during, during his State of the Union address. With Democrats no longer the party in control in the House and holding a slim majority in the Senate, it's highly unlikely that these pleas will go very far. And of course, this marks the first time Speaker Kevin McCarthy will preside over the joint session, sitting next to Vice President Kamala Harris, who had a less than positive expose in the New York Times this week, and we'll see if that turns out to be as awkward as it could be. Uh, remember when Nancy <laughs> Pelosi, did she shred uh, Trump's copy of his speech, mm -hmm. the program? What did she shred? She shredded something. I think it was basically the program, which yeah. includes, I guess, the Trump's re remarks, the, the most transformative moment in American history, which made a huge uh, policy impact, as we all remember. <laughs> but look, I, I, well, this, is the, this whole thing is theatrics. I yes. mean, what, we have divided government. 
Nothing is going to come out of this. The opportunity for enacting legislation is over. It has passed, as it always does with a new president, right? The first, they have, they have a year, maybe two, to yeah. get anything done. That's over. We have divided government now. So now this is all about, honestly, this is all about positioning oneself. Yeah, and it's worth noting that, you know, Democrats kind of saying, oh, yes, we have these great ideas. We have this billionaire minimum tax. We have this levy on uh, that's supposed to deter corporate buybacks. For one, experts say that the levy on corporate buybacks is not high enough to actually deter any of that behavior. So the kind of behavior that caused the Southwest kerfuffle over the holidays, where they, they issued out all of this money in dividends and did corporate buybacks instead of investing in updating their you know, scheduling software so you wouldn't have an issue like that, none of that behavior is going to be deterred by Biden's mm -hmm. policy. But even if it were, you had the House for the last two years. So to, to try to propose a policy like this and then say, oh, well, it's not going to get done because of Republicans, it's complete and total theater. They want you to watch the next episode. They're, uh, exactly. They, they need I, to have a cliffhanger I, I'm supposed to, to hold your attention. That, that Democrats yeah. are suddenly deeply invested in a billionaire tax? Since when? Not only are they not investing in that, they'll bail out that in whatever industry it is, if they ever face any jeopardy, yeah. right? That the industry, including the airline industry, yes. a, a frequent example of this, they'll send their lobbyists or their people to Washington and say, oh, we really learned our lesson. Can you just, can you float us for yeah. now? They'll get their money. Then they'll do all the things that made everyone mad in the first place. Yeah. I, over and over again. It, it's gross. Could be the banking sector, could be the energy sector, could be the auto <laughs> industry, yeah. it could be anything. And we have different feelings about what the implications of that are. I would suggest that if the government is going to keep paying for these industries and the industries are going to keep fleecing the American public, then we should be having a conversation about nationalization. But I don't want to open that can of worms here. It's just to say that they get away with this bait and switch largely because the media, the corporate media, I'm sorry, writes articles credulously describing how the Democrats want good things. Oh, look at these wonderful things Joe Biden's going to propose in the State of the Union. And then they'll toss in a line that's, that, that absolve him from following through, saying, oh, well, if it doesn't work, it's because of the Republicans forgetting that just a month ago it wasn't Republicans and he had two years from the from the second he got into office the narrative was Biden can't do anything because of Manchin well, and Well the mainstream media is not at all interested in the substance of this right they this is about the posture and the appearance and the theater of it which doesn't actually matter to any normie regular person uh, you're right people are listening if they're listening at all if they're listening at all which is a doubtful proposition to begin with they're they're listening to hear what the policies are they want to know what the policies yeah, are, but the, me the media wants the, it's the, the pageantry of it. It's the, look how the Democrats, look how Biden is framing himself as the champion of democracy. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Something that nobody cares about. Yeah, I saw some coverage that was asking, you know, how rude are the, are the Republicans going to be in the audience? Are we going to get like a, a you lie moment? That's what people are kind of. That's what they're hoping for. That, not people, the media, desperate for yeah. that. They want Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert to have like a cat fight or something. Oh, they look want who's sitting down and won't clap for oh, the troops or, or, or that kind of coverage. It's disappointing. You're right. It's not substantive. Who didn't clap for Zelensky? That's going to be <laughs> well, <laughs> off every, with his head. Every, everybody <laughs> in our government, it seems, is going to not just clap for Zelensky, but drape a signed flag around um, their shoulders at the podium without questioning whether or not it's the least there's a hypocrisy do. with respect to how much they're willing to spend on Ukraine versus domestic spending. Don't expect to hear much about that. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, there are Republicans uh, who are willing to look at defense spending. We highlighted uh, that the Heritage Foundation has said uh, we need to take a look at defense spending. I was listening to Senator Rand Paul. Was mm -hmm. on. Uh, I was on Fox this weekend, and while I was in the green room, he was on with Maria Bartiromo, and she used the um, the kind of the Chinese spy balloon sort of say, Are we, "Is this now really a time to cut defense spending?" And Rand Paul turned right around and said, "Yes, yeah, absolutely. Our our, our ability to be be protected from Chinese spy balloons yeah. is the, the defense. The current defense uh, budget does not need to be that lucrative to, to deal with yeah, that." And, and he absolutely gets credit for that. It, it is worth saying that, and I don't know if it was the same clip, but in a clip I saw him talking about that, and I agree with him entirely on that. He also talked about cutting other social safety net programs that Americans yeah, rely gonna, on and are very that are very popular. Before we go, uh, what did you what do you make of uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders giving the response speech? I think it'll be uh, it'll be a nice flashback to the time when she was uh, <laughs> she was pres the first press secretary mm -hmm. for or maybe second maybe after second. Uh, after. after um, the guy who did Dancing with the Stars. Spicer. 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 Uh, so, uh, you know, she has a very uh, specific delivery. I, 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 I miss her 
kind of refusing to answer or saying she'd already answered the question. She takes a question from a reporter, says, I believe I already answered that. Thank you, and moves on. It's not the worst strategy. <laughs> it's Car- it's better Pierre. than the one they, they currently have. So, so mostly it'll be a, a nice flashback people, to see People her have said this is again. a demonstration of kind of a, a, a younger part of the Republican Party. People uh, you know, have argued, you know, does this say something about uh, kind of a Trump alignment and, a, and a, someone who is Trump aligned being in that position as opposed to someone who is maybe more DeSantis aligned or neutral or maybe going to take their own bite at the apple, bite at the presidency? The, the State of the Union speech doesn't matter very much, and the response speech <laughs> matters even less. So uh, we, sh- we shouldn't get all worked up about it. But I'm it would be delightful to hear her speak again. <laughs> That's my right. feeling. Well, I look forward to hearing what's on your radar next, Robbie.